Welcome to another episode of Friday Foresight TV. Uh, this one uh, week a month, Bob Kramer, founder of Nick, takes over the platform. So I am going to turn it over to him as soon as I have run our intro video. Hey guys, Steve Moran here. I just noticed last week on that little cartoon an image of me. I don't know why I can't get my glasses to stay straight and they actually put that into the video. And so now I'm so totally self-conscious of that. And with that, I'm gonna step away, Bob. I will let you and Jay uh, talk and I'll let you do the introductions. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. As always, we appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate your passion and enthusiasm for everything connected with senior living and, and housing and care for older adults. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me today, Jay Newton Small. Uh, Jay, in addition to being a fellow with me at Nexus Insights, is most significantly uh, founder and CEO of Memory Well. And uh, Memory Well is a digital platform for healthcare providers that replaces legacy intake questionnaires with brief, professionally written stories. We're going to have some fun in the next 30 minutes. For those of you in the senior living uh, field, I hope this 30 minutes, if you know me at all, I hope it's going to challenge you and make you think about some things and maybe especially think about your data in ways you haven't thought about it before. But before we get into those questions, uh, Jay, uh, first of all, thank you. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, excited to have this chance to have a conversation. And remembering one of the first times we sat down and really chatted at length, and one of the first things you did was sort of share for me what was the inspiration for starting and founding Memory Well in the first place. So would you share that with our with our viewers today? What Briefly, what is memory well, but most importantly, what's the story behind it's it's you're starting it? Well, Bob, first of all, thanks so much for having me. And I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so honored to be a part of Nexus. It's just been so illuminating and fascinating the conversations that we have and um and the people that are involved. So it's just awesome. Um so memory well, as I told you, uh, is grew out of my experience caregiving for my father. And I should tell you my backgrounds in journalism. Um, mm -hmm. I spent more than a decade at Time Magazine covering everything from the Obama White House to the Arab Spring. Um, and I was four years as Bloomberg's White House correspondent before that, covering the Bush administration. So, um, but, and I took my writing skills and really applied it to my father's care. My dad had Alzheimer's. And a few years ago, when I moved him into a community, they asked me to fill out this enormous 20 page questionnaire about his life. And I was sitting there struggling to write down the answers to these stories, thinking, you know, A, I was a professional writer and even I couldn't answer some of those questions, like describe your parents' 40 plus year marriage in four lines. That's like writing haiku. And mm -hmm. B, like, I didn't have a lot of faith that anyone of the staff could read and remember 20 pages of handwritten data points for the like hundred residents there. And right. so instead I, I wrote down his story and it, you know, it was one page, I kind of plastered the community with it and it really transformed his care. Two of his caregivers were Ethiopian and they'd had no idea that my dad had actually lived in Ethiopia for more than four years early on in his career with the United Nations. And mm. they became his champions. They would sit for hours and ask him what it was like to work with Emperor Haile Selassie and what the Empress was like. And dad loved it because he remembered Africa still really well at that point for his early 20s, even if he didn't remember last week or last month or last year. And that's really what led me to start Memory Well. Hmm. Well, okay, let's fast forward to uh, you've, you've, you've stayed focused on your original focus, but you've also shifted. And just to go quickly, and you can give us more detail, but how does that then move to a recent successful seed funding round and you're out hiring uh, the lead for AI for IBM Watson? 
and how you know you know if uh, you know we, I've just heard you share why you started Memory Well, and now all of a sudden, uh, so I want to get at I guess a couple things uh, and start to get into our topic in terms of. I remember the very first time I uh, we we chatted. You talked about memory well in terms of you wanted to put the person back in person-centered care. Mm -hmm. So I know that's still very much your passion, but then relate that to where you're going now with data and what you know. Start start me on your data journey because you started it as a writing story, capturing mm -hmm. a story in mm -hmm. in brief sort of memorable prose where you could give a brief story to caregivers uh, about your dad so they could get to know him. And now you're out there making fascinating hires. Uh, so connect the dots for, for those that are watching today. So yeah, you know, as you know, Bob, when I first started, um, we were just very much a story company, and but we had a lot of people who came to us and said, you know, you're collecting this super fascinating data that's very mm -hmm. rich and very unique. And we were journalists. And so I think to some degree, we're sort of horrified, like, you know, oh, no, 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 Facebook destroyed our profession. We're not going to do data. And we were very like, no, 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 no. And then, but I think over time, we became convinced talking to different providers and payers about how they might use the data. Um, a, that we had a very unique set of data. Um, when the writers file the stories, they file keywords in each section, and that creates structured, mineable databases that with every story approaches 72% of what's traditionally considered social determinants of health. So issues of mm. housing insecurity, transportation insecurity, um, food insecurity, trauma, all of those things are things that we approach. Um, and then and then B, that we could do this in a way that we felt comfortable, right? That we weren't going to become Facebook and sell people's data in, in really gross ways that, or that we were going to um, commercialize this data, that it could be used very specifically to help improve healthcare outcomes. And so, um, you know, we, we've, we're, we're well into our first data pilots, which have been super exciting and really fascinating, mm -hmm. um, particularly with Prospero Health, who's just an in-home palliative care spinoff of Optum. And, you know, on the very basic levels, we take our stories and just translate, you know, this data into uh, something that a computer can understand, an algorithm can understand. Um, and so it's really the same information that's in the story, but then it uses that data and matches it with your health data and then um, allows algorithms to better understand you, right? And so with each story, we can often get to root cause of social determinants of health issues right from the get-go. Um, so it's hyper-personalized data that, um, compared to other data on the market is is really incredibly you know refined and and has a really mm -hmm. good sense of root cause like most other data on the market is scraped from publicly available sources or is collected in word clouds that need natural natural language processing that don't really understand the differences between likes and dislikes our data is is all sort of tagged and we have uh, structured databases as i said so um and that creates at scale, we just, as you mentioned, we just hired Martin Bakker from, um, from IBM Watson as our new head of AI. We're super excited to bring him on board. But as we get to thousands and tens of thousands of stories, we can then take that data, take the healthcare data, and begin to really understand, okay, the last hundred times we saw this happen, this intersection of social determinants of health issues mm -hmm. and health issues, the last 300 times, the last thousand times, we saw these outcomes. And so we can warn people, patients, as well as payers and providers, that this is likely to happen as an outcome and really help people get ahead of things. And it really goes to what I would say is the heart of the problem with our system. Right now, our system is a reactive system. It's incredibly mm -hmm. expensive because we react to a problem. If we know that a problem is coming down the pike and we can better match people with resources available, we can delay, defer, and even sometimes prevent those problems from happening. And that, I think, is what is essential for the harnessing of social determinants of health and healthcare moving forward. Well, help me and again, help our audience understand. So you you start out, you're telling sort of personal life stories. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about mining data about social determinants of health and food insecurity, transportation insecurity, relationship insecurity, all kinds of insecurities. Uh -huh. um, 
how do you marry those two? I mean, you, I assume, and maybe you can just give us a couple of examples. In other words, I'm assuming it's not that you've added uh, five stock questions on, are you food insecure? And here's the <laughs> definition of what I mean. So help me understand how a personal story mm -hmm. to help me understand the person yeah. and information that's codable, usable for predictive uh, algorithms. How do you marry that into, you know, how do you bring those two types of data into yeah. uh, the same data set? Sure. So I'll give you a great example of, um, you know, we ask really different questions. So we don't ask things like, are you food insecure? Because it's a terrible question that really nobody knows how to answer, right? right. Um, but we've always asked, and you know, things like, what are your favorite recipes? And what are your barriers to cooking those recipes, right? So I'll give you a great example of a guy whose story we did a few months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And he would never have said he's food insecure if you'd asked him this. He owned his own home, he owned a car, he could afford groceries. Um, but we asked him, you know, what's your favorite recipe and what are your bears cooking it? And he said, well, you know, my favorite recipe is my grandmother's shepherd's pie that my mother brought over that recipe from Ireland when she immigrated. She taught my wife how to cook it. My wife cooked it for me for, you know, twice a month for 50 years. But my wife died four months ago and, you know, and I, I haven't had it since. And, and basically he talked about how, you know, he didn't know how to cook and he was afraid of cooking and he was afraid of the mm -hmm. kitchen. And so in the four months since his wife had died, he'd just eaten nothing but McDonald's and he'd gained 20 pounds. Now he was food insecure, but like the traditional sort of intervention that most people would say if they marked you as food insecure would be, oh, send him to a farmer's market or get him fruits and vegetables. Right. That wouldn't have helped him because he doesn't know how to cook. And so what he needed was cooking classes um, and someone to show him how to make this shepherd's pie. He had the recipe. He was just intimidated to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of thing where we can get, like I said, at root cause pretty quickly just by asking the typical questions that we've always asked. You know, for example, another one is, um, you know, for housing insecurity, one of our favorite questions is, have you ever owned your own home? And people love talking about saving up for their first home and then like building that house, raising their family there. Um, and then the transition potentially to retirement, you know, buying the condo in Florida or whatever the stories are, the cabin in Wisconsin. Um, you have these very rich sort of tales, but then also really illuminate what's going on in this person's life now in terms of the roof over their head and any problems or insecurities or issues they might have with that. Hmm. That's fascinating. So in essence, you're using almost interview skills coupled with relational content, I mean, the relationship building of a good mm -hmm. interviewer. And so you're getting them talking about who they are in their life, but at the same time, in a way that gets at clues, for instance, your example of the end of the gentleman who lost his wife, mm -hmm. classically, many folks look for people who are food insecure in terms of, uh, do they have healthy food or do they live in an area called the food desert? Yeah. Well, this guy might have had farmer markets and great food outlets and he had the money to buy it. So you would never classically have put him in the category of food insecure. But by the way in which you asked the questions, you actually got at something that was key to understanding something that with putting on 20 pounds. And so he was starting a downward spiral. Exactly. So, that's fascinating. Well, let me, um, you know, one of the things that we um, talked about in when we um, describe what we're going to talk about today is we said, are your residents truly known, valued, and seen by your staff for more than their ADL needs or their underlying health conditions? As you know, I've often been, I've been saying for years that we ask important questions, but we don't actually ask the most important questions. The questions that really get at that a person's sense of identity and self-worth and who they are. And so talk about sort of, let's take the next step then. You're collecting this data. How can this data really, coming back to that statement that I've remembered since the first time you said it to me, Bob, I wanna put the person back in person-centered care. Well, mm -hmm. let's take that a step further. Maybe you can give some examples of how folks you're partnering with now are using this data 
to personalize and put the person back in person-centered care. Can you maybe give us some examples of that? Because I'm trying to sort of close these loops here that I think otherwise, honestly, aren't intuitively obvious to most people. Yeah, absolutely, Bob. So we have another great pilot with PCH Mutual, which is an insurer of senior living communities, 2,400 of them across the country. And, you know, what we've done with them is, you know, the data on the most basic level replaces those those handwritten questionnaires. And so if you want to just quickly sort and search the data, you can figure out very quickly, these five guys play golf, these 11 ladies knit, you can form a golf club and knitting circle, you can connect people based off of mutual interests and likes these two guys, both studied engineering in Notre Dame, or, you know, these other guys served in Korea, or whatever it is that you have, you can sort of really connect people and form those connections and encourage them to talk about those connections, read each other's stories. Um, we actually even have per community in interwoven timelines where they can choose to share different posts about different moments in history and see each other's where they were at like say the moon landing or the assassination of JFK um, and on the digital timelines that they can build out associated with their stories. So you can really build what I would say is actual community um, in these places. People can know each other well, the staff can know them very well. And in fact, one of my favorite things is when uh, folks put up the stories um, on the wall when for, so that when people come in and visit, they can read each other's stories so that you know the nephew of this woman visiting can see that he's his daughter is going to the same school that like you know this other you know my father went to potentially or somebody else and mm -hmm. can talk about that um or the lady coming in to give them a haircut or give them a shave can read about them and know about them and engage them in a personalized way we all know that personalized engagement is key to really good care it's quality care the gold standard of care is personalized person-centered care but how do you do that unless you a have their story but then b are able to harness that data and be able to really put people together match people together and help them get to know each other because oftentimes it's hard for them to do so so that's on like the most basic level on like a everyday level how our data can be harnessed and used well um particularly the the sort of second area, there's the first area, you sort of talked about two levels in which your data can be used. One is just the sort of initial sorting, so to speak, and <laughs> what becomes available right on the surface of these connections of interests and lifestyle and, 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 and historical experiences. Then there's a second level, which is truly mining the data in terms of algorithms and, and why you brought, is it Martin on board and, and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to pro push on that a little bit because you mentioned earlier, you know, you're, you, you, you have a, a, a long career in journalism. You're very aware of how Facebook, the Internet and the available of massive amounts of data can be used to um, uh, to hurt and destroy not only industries, but particularly individuals and individuals lives. So mm -hmm. if I'm. If I'm, what's it mean, particularly when you get to that several second level of, of algorithms and predictions and so forth, how, do, what's responsible use of data? If I'm a senior living provider and I'm just, or, or I'm a healthcare insurer or, or, or I'm a, a risk bearing entity, uh, uh, take it like an Oak Street or somebody like that. What does it mean? Um, how do you both assure them, but more importantly, assure the individuals themselves and their families that this data isn't being misused, that this data is in a sense making them almost a commodity to be marketed at because yeah. of they have these problems or these interests and will therefore sell you the following. So mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about that because you've mentioned it, you're very aware of the destructive power of data and commercializing data. So how do you all how do you all work through that? So we have absolutely pledged that we're never going to use personalized data for commercial to commercial ends. So we're not going to sell your data to somebody looking to sell you anything, right? Like mm -hmm. um, you know whether it's adult diapers or 
you know, adult daycare or whatever it is, you know, in, in that senior space that they want to sell you, that's not something we're ever going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, you know, we just, as you mentioned, we just raised a 2.5 million seed round in our first venture mm-hmm. round and led by Argon Ventures out of Boston, which is really a deep tech data investment group, right? So that their entire thesis is deep tech. Mm-hmm. And a lot of our investors are deep tech data experts who have exited companies and are experts in the space, but we also have experts and two sets of investors who are social and under, social entrepreneur investors. And so they believe in the double, triple bottom line of our company that we can do this to great profit, but also not sell this data, not do it in a way that is that is ethical and that is going to be only good for the patients and not, you know, corrupt the patients, not sort of make them victim to commercialization or anything else like that. And so really, when we talk about individual data, we're talking about um, getting to root cause, root, pro- root sort of problems with social determinants mm-hmm. of health, and then making recommendations, working with your providers and payers to sort of say, hey, we see food insecurity as a problem. The root cause of that food insecurity is an inability to know how to cook. And so we would recommend, you know, for example, uh, cooking classes, right? That's that's how we would use that data. We're not going to like sell, you know, sell that, that information to cooking class, you know, purveyors of cooking classes, but um, but that just goes back to them to say we see this issue and we would recommend an intervention here, right? Um, like long term, the bigger play for our AI data is all depersonalized, right? So it's really just creates an, an, an engine of information, an engine of knowledge that the AI builds upon with each new story that then can inform as a new story comes in, a new data set comes in and says, this is like these other cases, these, you know, however many cases, and this is where we see a potential risk and a problem from happening. So the bigger data sets and the bigger sort of way that we envision doing data sales is all completely depersonalized and anonymous, um, Mm -hmm. and therefore, again, protecting the patient. But you know, on the individualized level, when we work with communities, we really do only do it to like, you know, we're working back with your original provider. The only person getting that information is that provider. And really, you have to sign off on it, too. If you want to do the store and you don't want to share it with your provider, you don't have to. So families have this choice throughout the process about who they want to share the story with, how public is the story, and if they want that data shared with their providers. If they don't want the data shared, they don't have, we don't share it. And so the whole way through, we've really tried to make sure that we want to protect families, protect patients in this place as much as possible while also helping them, you know, giving them insight, connecting them with other people with like interests and like minds, helping them get to know their frontline caregivers or their frontline caregivers get to know them um, in ways that they might not before and, and really building empathy and connections in a time of, you know, especially during COVID when people can't, families can't visit, becoming that voice that can help mm-hmm. augment that, that family, that missing family voice and, and tell them who they are and what they like. So again, then at two levels, the first level where it's an individual story and data giving them or their family control over with whom it's shared. Then the second level is uh, uh, depersonalizing the data when you're getting to large data data sets and using uh, 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 on a broad level predictive analytics then that's a per- depersonalized thing, which then can be used in the personal situation to suggest an intervention. Would that be a, 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 a sort of a way of, of summarizing what, what you're trying to do to sort of make sure you're ethically using data and that, you know, if I'm allowing, you know, if I'm encouraging you to do life stories for my residents, then I'm going to not end up on the other side of uh, uh, irate family members that dad's information is being used to sell th- sell things to him. Absolutely. That's exactly, you've hit the nail on the head. That is exactly how we use our data. Yeah. Well, let's, let's then, uh, let's close our time. We've got, uh, I don't know, about five or seven minutes left. And what I'd like to do now is let's talk specifically about senior living and uh, the opportunities there and the challenges there. You know, uh, I, I put in, in the questions uh, uh, in preparation for this, uh, our time together, I put a senior living missing the value of data to deliver improved care and quality of life for residents. And obviously providers right now, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're hopefully coming out, but in a prolonged period of being in the midst of a, of a, of a, a 
an, an epic event that's had horrific consequences in many cases in terms of deaths and illness, both staff and residents. It's also uh, dramatically impacted, in many cases, occupancy, expenses have far exceeded revenue. In the midst of that situation, we also have a great deal of focus now about how do we, as a result, better integrate healthcare services with housing. Secondly, how do we no longer ship out our residents for reactive curative healthcare, but how do we better in their home where they live with us, manage their ongoing conditions and, and, uh, and address them as they live with us. So talk to me about both two things. One, what have been your experiences with senior living providers? And then secondly, where do you see the opportunity? If there's, a, if, if, if there's someone with a senior living provider sort of trying to say, well, of all, you know, when we were talking before the show we were, with Steve, we were both, we were all agreeing that they're, you know, you're getting a, a provider today is probably getting, if they all came directly to her or to him, a tech pitch an hour. And so, you know, help, help the folks watching, you know, what is it that this offers that could be dramatically transformatively different for a senior living provider? And are they missing an opportunity if they're not making use of it? Absolutely. I think, you know, we've, we, when we started out in senior living a few years ago, um, we definitely tried to, you know, the people we were working with say, hey, we have this data, we're collecting this data, do you have any interest in it? And most people were like, I, I don't really, what would we do with the data? I don't know what we would do with the data. We don't have really an interest in the data. And it's yeah. it's been really striking to us to see how payers and providers have, are much more interested in the data. They're much more savvy with understanding how the data can be harnessed. and even on like a commercial level to sort of say, okay, you know, we can de, uh, we can sort of anonymize the data, but tell you and like, you know, pretty specifically, like mm -hmm. here are like, you know, target areas for you to, to, to market to, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. these are, these are your core, like, you know, these are all of your people. Um, these are the people who you have in your communities. If you want to market to like-minded people, this is where we would recommend you would market. I mean, like there are ways in using that data across the board in terms of sales, in terms of marketing, the stories are also obviously a very powerful marketing tool just to show that you care. I mean, the number one reason why people don't put their loved ones into assisted living is they don't believe that they're going to be known and treated like the person they know and love. And so to say to them, hey, not only will we know your loved one, we're gonna have a writer tell their story, everyone here will know that story. It, it just goes a long way to saying that this is a really great place for mom. And so, you know, you know, we're an even alternative value added partner. I mean, just like the the idea that person centered care, everyone talks about this and puts lip service mm -hmm. to it, but actually showing that you're providing person centered care starts with actually knowing your people and knowing your residents. And, and actually I would say having a good business plan also starts with having that data and understanding who are you serving to better go out and recruit more of those people to serve. And so, um, that way, I would say, you know, we would we certainly could supercharge those businesses. And and I think that to me, like it's always sort of made me sad and that that senior living didn't understand the power of data to such a degree and, and didn't understand how to harness it both in their marketing and sales, but also just in like their daily activities, being able to organize hyper personalized activities, be able to connect residents to each mm -hmm. other on a digital level um, and even better target all of the other panoply of solutions that you've got going on in the digital realm, whether it's virtual yoga classes or virtual art classes or other things, being able to target those interventions, target those activities to the people you know will really appreciate them instantaneously. That's the power of data. And that's what I think is the missing piece, frankly, in senior care. Yeah, you made the comment to me that uh, when we were having an earlier conversation that much of social determinants of health, even now, and by analogy, I would say also senior care is a shot in the dark. It was the phrase that you used, kind of a shot in the dark, which I would say it's based on anecdote and instinct rather than data. So what you're really trying to do is to use data, not to invade people's privacy, but to understand who they are and, and in essence, see them as a person, not as a sum of their conditions or their ADL needs or, or, or whatever. And so 
what you're really saying is whether or not it's memory well, and this is Bob Kramer speaking, you're saying senior living provider, there is power in, in if you have the right data, there is power to A, just knowing your residents better, but ultimately being able to, to know who to target and provide better care to. I mean, I, I, we had a Nick talk last year by Dan Sinelli, a retired architect now with Perkins Eastman, and he talked about how seeing uh, senior living in the future would be a lifestyle dating app, occasionally then being used to match people in residential settings. But the mm -hmm. lifestyle dating app was first of all, finding people with a common purpose, passion, interest, which is part of what you're talking about at that first level use of your data. So maybe closing comment, 30 seconds, and maybe you can tie it back to my, to your quote that I use, shot in the dark. Why does this elevate us out of the a shout in the a shot in the dark? Absolutely, Bob. I mean, you're like the shot in the dark is is where I think we are right now. Everybody's kind of guessing who are the people to target, who are um, the 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 residents that they that are most you know that that are most likely to use these services. And we take the guesswork out of that. We make we shine light on like tell you exactly who are the people you're serving, what are their interests, how best to connect them, and connect all of those dots and be able to connect all of those systems together and really bring, I would say, this into the modern era with the data sets that we have so that you can market, plan, sell, and 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 actually care for these people in hyper-personalized ways that takes all of the guesswork out of this. So thank you again. Hyper-personalized, put the person back in person-centered care so that residents are seen, uh, known, valued, and seen for more than just their needs or their finances. So thank you, Jay. Thanks so much for joining me. I do want to say before Steve, you come back in that uh, I hope folks will join me next month uh, when I'm uh, going to be delighted to have Jacqueline Kung, uh, the uh, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of Activated Insights, the senior care uh, arm of Best Place to Work. And she's going to be sharing what will be brand new data from some of their extensive survey data about uh, particularly surveying staff. And I think coming out of COVID, folks will be very interested in that. Again, there's a common theme here, data and the power of data. Having data by itself, worthless, actually leads to paralysis. Having the right data and knowing how to use it, a game changer for the future of our sector. Thanks so much, Jay. Jay, thank you very much. I have one question for you, though, before we close out. Jay, do you have, sort of looking at the big data picture of what you've been looking at, do you have any surprising insights that you've come out from um, that you can share with us? Um, you know, we did a survey um, early on with one of the payers that we're working with about of their, like, how many of their patients had um, SDOH, social determinants of health data attached to their electronic health records. They thought before going into the study that 50% would have some form of SDOH data. They were shocked to find that less than 1% of their wow. records had SDOH data attached. So yeah, this is a huge gaping hole in our knowledge of these patients. And so being able to just get us up to speed and get us that data to begin with is super powerful. And will I think just really, I mean, just having that data to work with with algorithms is, is amazing. Yeah, I, the, the thing that struck me and will actually turn into an article is that we are, when our residents come in, we are actually not asking the right questions so that we know how to give them the best lives. And then even worse, even if we ask the right questions, the question is, are we really interpreting the answers in a way that's going to serve the residents? Or are we like a, a carpenter who only has a hammer and everything looks like a nail when it shouldn't? So I think that's really, really important. I think this big data uh, uh, challenge opportunity could transform the industry. So Bob, Jay, thank you very much. Jay, where do we find you? Uh, we're at memorywell.com and I'm really easily found at J-A-Y, J, my first name, um, like a blue J at memorywell.com. So. Perfect. And Bob, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you both for what you're doing to make the industry a better place for residents and team members. 
Have a good weekend. We'll see you back next week. We are going to talk uh, with somebody who has had who is crushing the occupancy game. They their March was the best they've ever had in their industry. Their April is even better. You will want to be there and hear that story. Thanks again for watching. Thanks.